us today at The Voice of America is um, Ambassador Stephen Pfeiffer, former ambassador to Ukraine and currently a visiting fellow with the Brookings Institution. Thank you, Mr. Pfeiffer, for coming today. Happy to be here. Um, September seems a very active month for Eastern European uh, mm -hmm. politics. Uh, last year, uh, Russia started the war with uh, Georgia. This year, we are witnessing, it looks like, diplomatic war between Ukraine mm -hmm. and um, and uh, Russia. Um, what is your reaction to President Medvedev's letter or message to Ukrainian President Yushchenko? Well, the message and the fact of its publication, uh, I think, are puzzling people here in Washington. Uh, certainly, the letter goes into a list of well-known differences between Kyiv and Moscow. Uh, but the tone of the letter, the way it was put out, the, uh, the notion that uh, Russia is not going to send an ambassador to Ukraine, seems more to increase tension rather than to try to find a way to improve relations. Um, a lot of experts said that probably this message was um, uh, was sent to Ukrainian people, to the voters of mm -hmm. Ukraine, not that much as to President Yushchenko. Do you agree? Well, it's, it, it's, it's hard to understand. I mean, I, I suspect actually part of the motivation may be aimed at voters in Russia in, in terms that a, a lot of Russian foreign policy actions are designed to send a certain image to the Russian population. And apparently there's a calculation in the Kremlin that this kind of forceful stance against Ukraine uh, is good local politics. Now, how this plays in the context of Ukraine when you're five months out for an election remains to be seen. You know, my, my suspicion is it, it may have a different impact rather than intended in terms of how it uh, resonates with uh, Ukrainian voters. Some experts said that it's probably can uh, back, uh, backfire to Russia? Do you well, I, I, I think there is a possibility that it will backfire. I mean, if you look at the past when, when Russia has tried to overtly interfere in Ukrainian politics in the run-up to election, for example, back in 2004, when President Putin made two visits, uh, or then President Putin made two visits to Ukraine right before the first and second rounds of elections, in which were barely disguised campaign visits on the part of Mr. Yanukovych, I suspect that actually did not help Mr. Yanukovych. It probably hurt him. And, and we'll have to see how this one plays out. But, uh, but I, uh, this is the kind of thing that I, I, I don't think plays well in Ukraine. How, uh, from the uh, Western point of view, how it looks like, how Ukraine and how Russia looks like in this development? Well, uh, from the reactions I've heard in Washington, what, what people are seeing is this does seem to be an effort by Moscow to crank up the pressure on Kyiv. Uh, and it's difficult to understand, does this really help uh, Russian foreign policy at the moment? I mean, do, does Russia really want to have you know, bad relations with another one of its neighbors. Uh, and the uh, State Department was, I think, fairly clear in its response yesterday where it said it wants to see constructive relations between Washington, uh, between Moscow and Kyiv. You know, but at the end, uh, it's up to Ukraine, and Ukraine has the right to determine its own foreign policy course. Uh, that's the uh, next question. How uh, adequate do you think was the President Yushchenko's response on that message? Well, it seems to me that, that President Yushchenko's response really responded point by point and I think gave the logical counter response to the arguments in President Medvedev's letter. Uh, but again, you know, this kind of rhetorical back and forth between the two countries, it's not going to help change relations. They need to get to work on some of the real differences that divide them and, and come up with a different approach. And this is sort of the initial letter from President Medvedev wasn't helpful. And when it's publicized like that, you know, it, it's kind of hard to see that message as designed to try to improve relations. I think it had another objective. Um, do you believe that it's possible for Russia and Ukraine have a constructive relationship as an equal partner? Um, I think it's possible, but at, but at some point, you know, Russia does have to accept uh, that Ukraine has the right to make its own foreign policy choices. And when you have that basic uh, acceptance that Ukraine is a, a full and equal partner, that may allow the development of a more normal relationship. And certainly it's in the interest of both Russia and Ukraine to have a normal relationship. These kinds of tensions, they don't help either country. Um, what does uh, that message say about the impact of Obama visit to Russia, about Russia meaning, what does it uh, uh, say about impact of Obama visit and, to, and Biden visit to Ukraine? Well, I, I'm not sure that the message gives us any indication in terms of how the effort to reset relations with 
between Washington and Moscow is going to go. I mean, I think it was understood certainly in Washington, and I believe also in Moscow, that while there was an effort on the part of Washington to try to improve the relationship, and certainly if you look at U.S.-Russia relations today, they're better than they were seven or eight months ago. There are some positives that just weren't there at the end of 2008. Uh, but it was also probably understood on both sides that the question of how the United States interacted with countries such as Ukraine and Georgia was probably going to generate some friction. And there are going to be differences because the United States basically wants to keep doors open to countries such as Ukraine to, to, to link into Europe. Whereas when you look at Russian discussions of things like a sphere of privileged interest, it's pretty clear that Moscow would like to draw a red line and, and keep Ukraine on the opposite side of that line from institutions such as the European Union and NATO. So there's going to be a contradiction there. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, U.S.-Russian relations can improve in other areas. Um, what should be the priorities uh, of the leadership team uh, that will be in power after presidential election in January, uh, meaning in Ukrainian, uh, Russian-Ukrainian mm -hmm. relations? Well, it seems to me that one of the first priorities for uh, the Ukrainian uh, uh, leadership after the election is to get its own house in order. Uh, uh, Ukraine will be in a much better position to deal with Russia, to deal with the Europeans, to deal with the United States, uh, if it has a co coherent, consistent foreign policy, which has been difficult the last several years. A and certain sorts of domestic reforms, for example, uh, energy reform that allows Ukraine to put its energy house domestically in order and will reduce the ability, for example, of Russia to use energy as a leverage, uh, as, a, uh, as an instrument of leverage vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. So I think that ought to be the first focus, is getting the domestic house in order. And then the Ukrainian leadership has to decide how it wants to orient its policy. What sort of relationships does it want with Russia? What sort of relationship does it want with the West? Um, it it's, uh, depends a lot on who will win a uh, presidential election in Ukraine. And we, from the response to the message, Medvedev's message, uh, we already see the different difference of positions uh, mm -hmm. between uh, three or four candidates of yeah. Ukraine. So how do you see these differences? How do you think it would develop yeah. in, the, mm -hmm. I mean, depend on who is who will win? Well, I, I think there are going to be some differences, but I also think it's important not to exaggerate those differences. I mean, I suspect that if you uh, asked the three highest ranking candidates in the polls, Mr. Yanukovych, Prime Minister Timoshenko, and Mr. Yatsenyuk, Ask them, do they want to be in Europe? Do they want Ukraine to be a modern European state? All three would say yes. All three would probably agree that they would like to see a closer relationship with the European Union. Now, there's probably going to be a difference between the three on, on questions such as NATO. But, but there are also important similarities there, which hopefully will allow Ukraine to appear to pursue a more coherent policy after the election. And the last question, um, as Ukraine marks its um, 18th anniversary, um, what do you, as, uh, do you see as a biggest uh, roadblock um, to Ukraine being a prosperous European sure. country? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's important because Ukraine has made a lot of progress. And I'd cite particularly in the democracy area. Uh, and this, this continues to be one of the points when, when people look at Ukraine and they look at how far Ukraine has come since 1991, where you have a political system that is going to give Ukrainians in the presidential election in January, a real choice. There will be multiple candidates representing different views. There will be uncertainty as the election. And I think there's a certain amount of confidence that the election process is going to be free and fair. That moves Ukraine already a huge distance towards becoming a modern European state. Now, I, I think, again, it, to, to complete that path, Ukraine has to do uh, some of the difficult reforms that so far it, 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 it's, it's put off, energy reform, economic reform, probably uh, constitutional reform in terms of ending some of the ambiguities in the gray areas in terms of the authority of the president and the prime minister and the executive branch versus the RADA. Getting those issues done internally and hopefully after an election uh, there's an opportunity to move in tackling difficult questions and that the next president will be moved to tackle these issues in a very forthright way uh, because it doesn't become easier as time goes by. Thank you so much. You're welcome.